Hi. So, uh, I am Alberto Planas. I, I want to talk a bit about the remote access station in microS. And we are going to start uh, talking about the TPNs. For the me, TPNs was a kind of uh, a new discovery. I mean, maybe one year ago, two years ago, I have some idea what are the TPNs. But doing this work, I really learned what they are about. I think that they are really cool and remove some biases that I have previously. So I would like to start this, this discussion uh, talking about what are the TPNs. Just for curiosity, who know what is a TPN or work with that? Oh, several people, okay, this is very cool. So TPNs are kind of old. Uh, the specification for that comes from the uh, late 90s, and I think that the first uh, prototype of the first product was uh, in 2009. After that, they, we have a very fast evolution until uh, TPN uh, 2.0. That is basically what we have uh, in our laptops. Basically, there are two versions that are very spread. That's 1.2 and 2.0. But since two years ago, something like that, everything is focused in the new, in the, in the new version. It's very famous, the Windows 11 uh, 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 relationship with TPN2. And I think that basically the full industry is moving to, to TPN2. There are a lot of advantages for TPN2. One of them is that it's completely agnostic of the algorithms that are going to be used. And we can see that that is going to be an advantage. So if uh, some moment of time we discover a flaw in one of the SHA family, we can change to a different algorithm and uh, nothing is going to break. So the, the device is expected to, to kind of work. If not the device, the specification is, complete, is going to be completely correct. Um, there are different implementation of TPMs. Uh, it's expected to be delivered in a chip, so real physical device. Those devices are extremely cheap, extremely slow, very crappy, and they do very well what they are doing to do, but they are not uh, uh, good for um, like a cryptographic coprocessor, something that is going to speed up uh, the encryption or certain uh, 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 cryptographic uh, algorithms. They are really slow, and they need to be considered as a helper. Some tool that you can delegate some actions, and you are going to delegate some of the trust that you are going to put in your system, but not as a helper for, the, uh, for speed up the, the certain cryptographic operations. There are, as commented, there are different implementations besides the hardware device. There are other implementations that uh, are living in the firmware. And some of them are living in certain part of the CPU. So the, the, some CPUs have like a protected mode, like a, uh, a isolate execution mode that can run algorithms uh, completely isolate for the rest of the system so they, they can access a certain region of memory that no one can. And this, it's impossible to introspect, to check what is happening in this area when this, this CPU mode is running. So I, I think that this laptop is a traditional one, so it's kind of hardware, but we are going to find more and more uh, C, uh, CPUs with a mode that is going to behave like a, a TPM. I think that is, the name is Pluto, some specification that is ongoing, that is going to be basically the future. Uh, this is the, the, an Infineon the, uh, TPM and some plugins that for all uh, motherboards you can plug. This, the, the connection is very trivial and, and, and the protocol for that is super standard. So TPMs are something that you can use for certain things. For example, uh, you can use a TPM to identify devices. So when you buy a TPM or you, you, you start one TPM, uh, they have inside one uh, uh, one key that is an endorsement key that is completely secret. So we have the public part that is going to be public, but the secret part is going to be always secret. There is no way, there is no protocol to extract the key from the TPM. And each TPM is going to have one different. And using different algorithms, you can create new keys derived for the first one, and you can create like hierarchy of keys that are uh, like temporary, you know, you can reset those keys and th those keys are going to be forgotten. But eventually you can use one of the other key that is going to be signed by the public part of the key to identify this device. So you really don't know who is the, the one behind that, but you can validate, okay, this is a device that I trust and, and, and it's in my list of good devices. So it's kind of helpful for things like VPNs, SSH connections. 
you can use, um, so internally, the, the TPN have a random number generator. It's kind of good. So the, in the specification, it's explained uh, how the RPN is going, uh, RGN is going to work. And you can delegate into this RGN like a, a more robust way of generating uh, random numbers. So they have like a seed of uh, entropy, and there is a very specific algorithm to reuse this entropy to generate uh, random numbers. So that means that you have a tool that can help you to generate keys. Uh, for example, keys can, can, that can be later used to, to encrypt your hard disk, like full disk encryption, or to, to encrypt certain files using FS crypto or something like that. can also be used like a K-ring, something that you can uh, store several keys in, uh, in there. I mean, the amount of memory that those devices have is really, really small, but they can uh, externalize this memory in your, in your hard disk or in, 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 in external uh, storage. Basically, it's using the, this uh, E-key that is inside to encrypt certain blob and store this blob outside. And you can use an API to go back and take this blob uh, um, and put that inside and clean in, in the TPM. So there is, you have this uh, property and you can use that uh, as a way to store a, a, a large number of keys that in reality are resident outside of the TPM. But also have a, a small memory of non-volatile RAM. So if you, for example, very early in the boot process, you need to recover a secret key uh, and UST doesn't have access to a, a disk, or there is no, mm, mm, it's the firmware basically who is running. You, you have certain slots that you can use to, to store keys. So it can be used, for example, for, uh, um, yeah, for this encryption or, or something like that. And also can be used to uh, unencrypt a small uh, segments of uh, memories of the disk using some symmetric uh, algorithms. We need to remember the symmetric algorithms are much faster than a symmetric one. So the TPN is slow, but can help you in that. And mostly when, uh, uh, mainly when there is nothing else that uh, can help you in the very early stage in the boot process. But I think that the main feature, um, the one that is more explored is uh, measuring boot. So uh, it's also known as a health attestation, Davis health attestation. Basically, internally, the TPN have like several banks of PCR. PCR are uh, platform uh, configuration registers. Uh, for each kind of SH uh, or hash family that we have, we have a different set of banks. Usually, we have between 12 or 24. The last specification is uh, more explicit, about 24. But you are going to have like uh, uh, those registers, a number from 0 to 23. And each register is going to be used uh, in certain moments in, during the, the boot process. Basically, we have a mechanism that is a, um, an expansion. So those registers uh, are limited in the amount of uh, action that you can do on, on, on that, for example. Something that you can do is to clean the, the register, like put a, a, a reset. And this is going to write zero or one, depending on the kind of register, inside the register. Something that you can do is also read that, but you can write that. So there is no operation to write a specific value inside the register. But you have uh, an operation that is known as extend. Extend is a, a hash operation that you are going to do using first the current value of the PCR, ap uh, appending at the back, so at the end of the, of the hash, um, a new value and calculate the hash of the full, uh, of the longer string. And this is the value that is going to back in the, in the PCR. So this is the only way that we have to, to, to write in a PCR. Basically, the measure boot process is, um, so very early in the, in the boot process, the firmware is going to measure itself and is going to measure the next state in the boot process. That is also a, another firmware component. Measurements that is going to read the, the memory and calculate a hash for this memory. And, and it's going to use the extend operation in one of the, the first four or five PCR registers that we have, depending on the state that you are. There is a specification that is going to explain you which one is going to be extended. So it's going to calculate the next stage, a hash, and extend one of the registers. And after that, it's going to delegate the execution to the next stage. So uh, every stage is going to measure the next one, and after that, it's going to, to delegate the execution. So this is going until the, the, the bootloader. So the, 
uh, early stage is going to measure all the stage in the UEFI firmware, and the UEFI firmware, the last stage is going to measure the group loader. And if you configure your group loader properly, grab and uh, uh, system D would uh, have this option, are also going to measure the kernel and the init RD using different set of registers, but you can extend the, the measurement until the init RD. Something that we need to remember is that uh, the, the, the TPN doesn't have access to the system, so there is not access to the memory, to the disk, so it's an explicit operation that you do on the, on, on the TPM. And also, uh, for each extension, there is like a log that is known as an event log that is going to take care of the kind of station, uh, extension, the data, and some, some meta information that is going to be tracked in memory. Eventually, this is going to be reached, uh, is going to reach the kernel, and the kernel is going to create a device that you can query to, to have the full log of your, of your, your boot process. And other tools is expected or are expected to, to make a, a, a guess about the health of your system. But exactly this, uh, in order to make the, the, the attestation to do to understand how healthy is your system, you are going to request to the TPN the current values of the of the PCR. This uh, operation is known as a quote, and basically what you are going to have is like a report, a signet report using the private key of the of the TPN that you can validate. That is going to explain you uh, the or is going to enumerate you the the values of the PCR, the current values, and you can still use the event log to check how the system reached these uh, these values. So this is like a graphic to understand what is an extension, but something that we need to understand is why this complexity, why uh, this concept of extension, or why this is safe. So something that we, uh, something that is obvious, if we 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 understand how the extension works, that is like a taking the value of the PCR, appending at the end a new hash, and calculating the hash of everything. This is going to make very complicated when you have a. Um, a PCR value is going to be impossible to understand or replicate how you reach this value. So if an attacker wants to inject and produce a, a, inject a, a different init RD, for example, that is going to have exactly the same uh, a, a PCR value at the end of the extension is going to be extremely complicated because there is no way to replicate uh, even when you know the, 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 the final value to replicate exactly uh, how to reach this value using the extension operation. And because the quote is also um, signet, there is no way to spoof that. So at the moment that you request a tip, uh, in the, to the TPN the quote, if there is some agent, some middleware that is answer a different thingy, it's something that you are going to detect. So uh, any change in the, quote, in the quote is going to be immediately detected because the signature is not going to match. This is this basically the, 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 the security. So there is a very convoluted way of writing data and a way to validate uh, this data that you read from the TPM. Incidentally, the, the protocol required to use a nonce that is like some random number used only one, only one time in order to request quotas. That means that when uh, a nonce that is kind of a secret, uh, uh, a very temporary secret that is, doesn't, doesn't only belong to the communication between the, the agent and the TPM. If you uh, have a, 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 if you receive the quote, you can validate that this quote was used using this nonce. So in part of the signature and the hash that you are going to calculate, this nonce is taking into consideration. That means that the replication is not going to be possible. So if you have a, an attacker have an old quote, this quote is completely invalid because the nonce is not going to match to the new, to the new, um, new communication. Yeah, and the only assumption in this protocol is that we need to trust in the TPN. So the, 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 the protocol the, and the signature and how, how it is working is expected that uh, um, it's going to be s uh, uh, sane. This is why it's known as a root of trust. So you can build a cryptographic solution, a trust solution, and the root of this trust solution is that the TPM is working properly and is a, uh, is a good TPM. Uh, we have a 
and a stack of protocols and, 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 and a stack of software that uh, we are going to require in order to communicate and program and use the, the TPN. At the very bottom, we have the device driver because the, 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 today's uh, the, the device driver is completely integrated into the kernel. And because the, the TPN have very short memory, very small amount of memory, and there are many, many processes that can access concurrently to the, uh, to the TPM, we have a, a resource manager that is going to uh, interchange certain memory, block, memory blocks from the TPN to outside and make changes, making to believe to the process that the TPN is completely 100% uh, for this process. So it's not aware that there are other uh, processes using the TPN. Uh, because uh, you can interchange the context of the TPN on demand. Today, this, uh, this uh, component is also part of the kernel, but there is kind of a migration now. So there is an, uh, an Intel stack that has its own broker. As today, it's still recommended to be used, but eventually in one or two releases in the kernel, it's expected that only the, the, the uh, 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 resource manager from the kernel is the one that you are going to use. It's a different device, so you're going to have div, uh, dev TPM, for the real hardware device and dev TPN R0 for the, for the uh, device that uh, uh, have the broker inside. You have, uh, there is a specification for the serialization, it's TACTI, TCTI. So part of the, the specification explain how to serialize the data, the parameters and the signatures uh, to the TPM. So that means that uh, with this specification, you can switch the implementation of the TPM very easily. So you can have a virtual TPM, something that is a, a, a simulator uh, of the TPM in your software or some real hardware or anything in between. Uh, because the only thing that is going to remain is the API and how you communicate and serialize this data. And on top of that, you have uh, more abstraction from APIs that is going to abstract a bit more and is, they are going to have more dependencies. So uh, the, the lower one that is the SAPI system API is going to be very raw. There is zero dependency, very specific for, for embedded devices. Uh, so you need to provide your hash algorithms, you need to provide your uh, signature validator, you need to provide all the libraries that you are going to use. And if you want some kind of more of abstraction, you have the extended enhanced system API where uh, some algo uh, cryptographic algorithms are already in place and there is some management of the, of the context for you. And there is a future API on the top that is really abstract but have more dependencies. This is more for, for desktop applications or operating system that is completely okay to link to certain libraries in, 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 in order to use a more abstract API for your device. But there is another API that is the um, is a CLI tool, so command line tools. Is a, actually there are like uh, two binaries, TPN2 and TSS. And using a, a, a system very similar to BusyBox, you can create links to those binaries with different names, and you can ex uh, explore like 140 different commands. Uh, is super useful to prototype application to understand how TPN works. Uh, you can re uh, it's not only for prototyping, you can, can really create a real product based on that. There is a web page that explains how to use that, and there are examples for that. For example, there is a, a full remote attestation script that from the very beginnings, using all, all these uh, CLI tools, is uh, uh, deploying a, a working solution. The drawback is that uh, is kind of incompatible. So certain versions, the family four, three, four, and five, are incompatible between them. So if you, your software is using Bison, uh, version three, you are going to have a hard time moving to version five. But well, it's what happens when the software is moving fast. Mm, recently, it's, uh, it's a bit slower. So uh, the mat maturity is going, is, is going to be there. So. On top of that, we have a, a Keylime. Keylime is an open source application. Uh, uh, I think that comes from the MIT, I think, uh, initially. But now maintained for in, in Fedora. Basically, Fedora and Red Hat are the principal maintainers. Now, OpenSUSE is also contributing and helping. So it's like a, a collective effort. Very specific to do remote attestation. Um, is taking care of uh, two stages in the remote attestation. One is uh, the proper measure boot. So all this protocol that we saw where each state in the boot process is measuring the next one. 
uh, you can validate that. With Keyline, you can validate that the status, the health of your system is the one that you expect. Something very useful when you have a uh, like thousand of computers distributed and you need to check that nothing in the boot process has changed. But also it's very helpful for, for runtime uh, at the station. So eventually you are going to reach the init RD and after that there is not more measurement. Now is the, the normal application, the service, Apache or Tomcat or whatever that you, you have in the system is the one that is going to be running. So we know about EMA and EVM, that is a, 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 sub a security subsystem in the kernel that are going to calculate the hash of the everything that has been opened or some binary configuration files that everything that has access or every file that the kernel have access is going to, we are going to, or the kernel is going to calculate the, the hash. And if you have a TPM, you can extend a PCR register that is number 10 with this hash and the metadata. So uh, with Keyline, you can re request the logs of extensions and compare these logs with a white list that the, a central compute have and check if all the hashes matches with the good binaries and the good configuration files for this system. Keyline is helping you on doing that. It's doing the request and doing the collection and the comparison. And if something goes wrong, you can trigger actions. Another feature that uh, Keyline is going to provide you is that there is a mechanism to deliver uh, an encrypted payload. So for example, if you want to uh, uh, you want to enroll a new computer in your system, you can deliver a secret key, certificate, and stuff like that using only Keyline and, and using the TPN to, to, to attestate that everything is uh, uh, in the correct place. Of course, before delivering the payload, uh, the system, the health of the system is going to be uh, validated. Um, eventually, something wrong is going to happen. So the system is going to be hacked or changed. And Keyline is, is going to help you to trigger action when this situation happens. And those actions, not all, not, they are not going to be triggered only in the system that has been hacked, but in the rest of the, of the system in your network. So for example, if you discover that uh, in your Kubernetes network, one of the nodes uh, has been changed, or there's a non-authorized change, or something suspicious that you want to attestate before the, go, uh, doing the green light and continued operation, you can trigger an action, an automatic action, uh, that is going to be delivered via this encrypted payload that can isolate, maybe using IP table rules, that can isolate those, uh, this, uh, this node. So one information that is, uh, all the nodes are going to receive is that uh, the IP and some revocation certificate that is going to describe and validate which one of the nodes has been uh, changing. And using Python or some, some script language, you can decide what actions are going to be triggered. It's completely up to the user what to do when something like that happens. Uh, another cool stuff is that there is like kind of a specification. There is an effort of versioning the API. We are currently version 2.1 of the API and some deprecation protocol that is going to allow to have different version of uh, uh, agents or different implementation of agents that are executing in your node. So the, 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 the standard one or the default one is one in Python, but there's another one moving very fast in Rust, very more, more, more specific to, to constraint devices. It's much more friendly in the resources that they are using. And thank you to the, this API. Uh, both can coexist in the same network. And something cool is that we, we integrate Keyline in, in, in just, we implemented two roles, and using one role you can deploy the verifier part, so the node that is going to control that all your network is in good, good state, and the agent one, that is the, the role um, that is, uh, is going to check no, it's the role that is going to install the agent and is going to report to the verifier the, the status of, the, the, of your system. And this report is going to be constant. You can program how much information you are going to send, but it's something that is going to, to run in the background, so the, the faster, the better. So the basically, this is the architecture. So you have like a control plane that is going to have the verifier and the register and some certif uh, certificate authority uh, in there. It's using internally, not very relevant. And you, 
in each node in your network, you're going to have an agent, Python or Rust, and you have a CLI that is the tenant that is going to communicate with the verifier or the agent to command certain actions. Yeah, so the, the, the use case is what we talk about. So with Keyline, you can do something as raw or so, so as basic as check that the PCR values are the expected one. And also there is a process that is going to replicate using the event log. It's going to replicate all the extension and compare those final values with the one that the quote from the TPN is reporting. And also the 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 there is a mechanism to so one problem the, the PCR have is that for security reasons, are very hard to replicate. But in the event loft, you have all the extensions. So imagine that you don't care about the final value of the PCR, but you care that there is a moment that the PCR extension con was extended by a specific hash function. So you can inspect the, the, event, the, the event log and provide a Python script that is going to search for this uh, 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 extension. And if it's not there, it's going to consider that the, uh, something wrong is in the... In the in the, in the system. For example, the kernel command line. Something that there is a very long set of kernel command lines that are good. You can validate that checking the PCR value that belongs to one set or requesting the event log and checking that the extension belongs to one list that, that you have. So they have, you have like two mechanisms and with Python you can choose where one or another. Yeah, and finally, you have the remote, the, all, uh, the running rem uh, remote attestation, so using IMA, checking that all the bindings and configuration uh, files are in, 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 good, in good, uh, good state, and trigger the actions that are okay for certain nodes when something, happen, something wrong happens in your network. So you are going to deliver a script, and you can make a, 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 a queries about who is the one that has been hacked and who I am. I, I am. And depending on that, you are going to trigger one action or another. So you can go very complicated on that. So this is the just role that we implemented. Eventually, there is going to be a demo. So maybe I can, I can show you something. But basically, we have here. This is the verifier. So we here have the, the logs. This is one, one agent. This agent has this configured to, to enable IMA. The appraisal for this demo is in log mode. So we are, uh, the kernel is only going to uh, uh, log the binaries and the, the configuration file that are read. And we are using a default policy that is the TCB that it's not the ideal one for real deployment because it's measuring too much, but for this, this demo, it's going to be okay. And there is a third node that uh, is not, uh, uh, the IMA feature is not going to be, uh, to be used. So something that we are going to do is that make sure that we can ping from one of the agent to the other one. So we can see that this is completely okay. And in this, uh, in this agent, we have here, in the verifier, this is the, the, the component in your network that is going to run the verifier service. We prepare, um, yeah. we prepare here a payload that contains some scripts and certificate that we, we want to deliver to all the node. And we have here an arrow list that basically is the, um, Sorry, but uh, so basically it's the hash, SH256 in this case, and, and the binaries of good uh, binaries and confidential files that we know that belong to agent one. So, uh, so in this payload we have uh, an Python script here that is going to be executed when something goes wrong. And we have an entry point here that is a uh, one script that is always going to be executed when the payload is going to be delivered. So something that we are going to do now is register one of the, the agents. Oh my God, without glasses, I can't see anything. Yeah. 
So we are registering agent number two. Now, the, what we did with, when we registered the agent, uh, we requested the, the measure boot logs, and we are rep replicating that in, in, the, in the verifier, and it's checking that everything is okay. And now we are going to register the agent number one, that is one, the one that has the email enabled. Now we can see in the logs that there is a, a more frequent uh, uh, entry. So it's requesting everything that has been executed for every two seconds, something like that. So we prepare here. So this is agent number one, the one that has the email enabled. We prepare a, a script, a script. that basically is going to show hello. We can execute that and nothing wrong is going to happen. So we can see in the agent, in the verifier that everything is uh, perfectly okay. But I try to make a change in the script. Yeah. So we are going to change the script and execute that again. Yeah, I was able to execute that properly, but now we are going to see what is happening in the verifier. And if I'm not wrong, we need to see that something has been detected here. And now we cannot ping the agent. So we trigger an action that basically what was doing is uh, he, yeah, is injecting a IP table rule where we uh, completely ignore the uh, change in node. Uh, yeah, that was a demo. So basically, we have a system that is working. It's integrated in microOS. And we are able to uh, monitor the health of the system and uh, uh, during the measure boot process, but also during the, the execution time. But there are more steps. So one of the problems that we found is how to uh, have a, uh, how to be confident that our allow list is the good one. So basically, the process now is that you go to the agent and calculate using a script all the hashes that are in your process. You can query the RPM to, to, to extract the, the good hashes, but eventually you need to copy them into the verifier. So ideally, uh, those hashes are going to live in the repository as a metadata. For that, we create a patch in the create repo C that is going to add a new metadata, metadata file that is going to uh, contain all the hashes of, of all the files in the RPM. And it's going to be signed by OpenSUSE or the, the owner of the repository. So from the verifier, you are going to be able to download the repositories or the expected repositories for all your systems, extract the hashes, and create an allow list that is going to be very specific for all your uh, nodes in your system. What is more, if your node updates, you are going to detect that because you can use the HTTP A tag to detect that the repository has been changed, re-download the, the extended metadata file, and recreate the allow list. So you have a way to synchronize the updates uh, of your agents or your normal computers, and the one that, uh, the information of hashes in your verifier. And something that we need to, to improve is uh, the EMA policy. Because, uh, again, in the demo, we use TCB, but we don't have anything better. From SUSE or OpenSUSE, we don't have any uh, uh, more specific policy that the user can use where the file measure is going to be a subset of your system. For that, we are going to provide something based on Selinux. With Selinux, you can provide some uh, tags in your files, and you can use the policy to exclude or include uh, files based on those tags. This is still need to do. But the first one is... Uh, uh, has been done. So there is a pull request in create repo and 
yeah, it's working properly and you can now have a mechanism to, to verify the data. Yeah, that's all from my side. Uh, maybe we have one or two minutes for questions. Okay, super. Thank you.